And that's kind of like part of the magic that Knife Banter had. You know, I, all day today, I was watching, rewatching a lot of the older episodes that you were on. Oh, I'm so sorry. (laughs) No, dude, you know what? Like, you're really good at it. So you you you. said that you studied film, right? Um, uh, What made you decide to do that? Because uh, my fiance actually like graduated with a degree in acting, like in college. Yeah. Like, is that what you were pursuing? No, not at all. So um, I actually in high school, I I remember it it was one of those moments where I was like, this is what I want to do. It was like a campaign election video. Mm -hmm. And one of the kids was running and um, he had a friend that made like this Mario video. And this is like, (laughs) like early aughts, like probably 2002. He made this Mario video and he he had like done some jump cuts where he like came out of the school garbage Mm -hmm. cans and stuff. And I was (laughs) like, great. It blew my mind. Like a student could make that because I'd, I'd kind of been playing around with like just the, the family camera and they were like nonlinear editing on computers was just coming out. And so I was like, film, I love it. And so I actually got into it kind of more the documentary route. I, I studied, mm-hmm. so I majored in broadcast journalism and minored in film. And so I, yeah, I kind of got into the storytelling side through broadcast, but also through film. And uh, yeah, so I never wanted to be on camera. Like I, I had zero desire to ever be on camera. I hated it. I, I loved running the camera and kind of telling other people's stories as a calculated risk. And gosh, man, Jamie and Matthew were both like these meme lords. They were just so good at it. <laughs> they were very like they'd, good. They'd throw stuff in there and I'd be like, I don't, I don't know what this means. Cause I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not much of like a, a hardcore, like <laughs> internet culture guy. Yeah. They'd throw stuff in and then the comments would light up and I'd be like, cool, do more of that. That's sweet. Mm -hmm. It was really fun to watch them. I think that was a very uh, smart and uh, strategic move. Maybe they were just having fun with it because that's, uh, I actually started to get into the knife hobby when knife banter started. I think that's why, like, I have this weird thing with you because I've had some pretty big names on the show. And like today was the first time where I was like, I better fucking watch the knife banter episodes and like see what to talk about. You know what I mean? Because I kind of got a little bit of nerves and that's never happened before. You know what I mean? Um, uh, But yeah, that was a very smart move because I think the world started to move into that direction. Meme culture, people were getting online more. And, you know, that's why I, I, I try to put knife content on every platform because the new generation and I'm starting to see it more now, is going to expect these highly cinematic, very well edited videos. And there are a lot of there are a lot of dudes doing that right now, too, um, in the knife community. Uh, I think I think the younger generation is going to need that, uh, want that more. I, I stumble into this knife hobby by accident. I was looking for a bag and I saw prepared mind 101 review like a tactical bag and I was like oh shit I could put wires in because I'm more of a tech guy I could put my wires in there and my battery pack and there's all these pockets and then I started to see like um like some bench made reviews and stuff like that and then I started to like meet people um and around the time that I got into the hobby like my pops had just died right and I had people who would like uh after my first couple of YouTube videos I've met some friends on Instagram and they were like, Hey man, you didn't put out a video this week. Are you doing good? Are you okay? And I was like, I didn't, I've never even met these people, you know? And, and I always tell people like, you know, the EDC community, like doesn't even need GoFundMe. when somebody, when one of us that we know is like hurting, they get into an accident, they don't have insurance. They want to get an operation or something, right? Like people pool in money. I, I've seen that for years. I mean, that, I think that's something that has been generations of knife makers, knife buyers. Like you, it, it, I think it kind of comes down from the custom market. So for years, I mean, into like the 60s. So you, you talk about um, A.G. Russell kind of started crafting all these people and getting all these custom knife makers together for his catalog. Um, but they would start mentoring each other. And so you have like this really long line of mentorship. So like take Lucas Burnley, for instance, he was mentored by Bob Tersola in New Mexico. And Lucas was also mentored by Tom Crine, who was Tom Crine was mentored by Bob Dozier. And so like, if you were to take the entire knife industry and start like connecting the dots of who has mentored who, as far as like custom makers go, there's this entire like 
family tree of where things come from and where they, where they started. But I also think if you were to do the same thing with the content consumers, the people that are just kind of mm -hmm. either buying the knives involved in the community, I also think there are similar connections of like, oh, this person. So like I have a connection with Gavco from years ago. Mm -hmm. We got in an argument, like a hardcore, like <laughs> internet troll <laughs> argument in the comments, <laughs> like bang your fists on yeah, the keyboard yeah. argument. And and uh, when I met him, it was like, we were, we were like brothers. I'm like, dude, yeah. like, bring it in, bro. And, <laughs> and, and that's the sort of thing. I, I think you're going to find that very similarly within the community. Mm -hmm. People usually have connected with somebody who means a lot to them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you find that in a lot of communities. The knife industry is really unique in that regard. Favorite color of Crocs. And when are we going to get Na NAFs patch? You know, the NAFs, NAFs. Uh, that's, from yeah, Z yeah. Stuff. that's from Zach stuff. Dude, I love Zach. Um, yeah. All right, color of Crocs. I, I went with gray because <laughs> I'm, I'm not very confident about my Crocs wearing yet. I just got to say <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm like, if I, if I buy the gray ones, maybe people won't notice that I'm wearing Crocs. <laughs> I mean, like, um, what's the deal with the Crocs anyway? Is it because you have kids so, who get messy all the time? Like, what is it? No. So, so like, they kind of have a bad rap because they're hideous. Like, they're <laughs> ugly shoes. Yeah, like, dude. straight up ugly, right? <laughs> so, they, they kind of have this bad rap. But um, I love them. And so, I bought them because I do, I do a little bit of backpacking. Mm -hmm. Last summer, I was, I was backpacking. And we had to cross the stream a couple times. Yeah. And I was just wearing flip-flops and they were trying to fall off in the stream. And I'm like, nah, nah, we got to change yeah. this. So I was like, Crocs. Yeah. And so but I bought a pair. Don't you wear like hiking boots or something? Like Yeah, but if you so if you're gonna cross a stream, mm -hmm. I usually take my boots off. Yeah. And either go barefoot or just wear flip-flops. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you get your you, you gotta protect your feet, right? So mm -hmm. if you get your shoes wet you're going to develop blisters because your socks are going to rub different. And yeah. so whenever we're doing like a knee deep stream crossing, I'll take my shoes off, throw them around my neck and throw flip flops on. But uh, yeah, these, these couple of rivers we crossed were a little bit more swift and I was worried I was going to lose my, my shoes. So I'm like Crocs with a little, little flipper <laughs> back thing. I'm like, oh that's the solution, man. That's hilarious, man. <laughs> 